have this secret fantasy that an artist can anticipate a scientific breakthrough, which even here, this is hard for me to say, because I, I went to school as an engineer. I worked in tech for a long time, and I'm skeptical. Even, even right now, I'm artist at the Neuroscience Research Center at UT, and I hang out with real scientists, and they're like really skeptical. But I went back to art school. Uh, I quit my job some years ago, and I went back to art school, and this is where I learned that as an artist, if you research something and you run into anything really difficult, you can just, um, you can just imagine your way through it, right? And also your job as an artist is to really pay attention to yourself. And sometimes those observations get eventually explained by science. So it was with that idea. It was uh, three summers ago. And I had cobbled together this way to take a look at brain patterns. I'd, actually, I'd hacked together this EEG uh, from parts from a toy. And this was gonna be my art figures out science idea. Um, and it was going badly. <laughs> right. um, the, the thing totally worked, right? I strapped it on me and anybody that would let me. And um, the idea was I had thought that there was a connection between your brain patterns, right? The rhythms, proportions, patterns in your mind and how you experienced right, rhythms, patterns, proportions in the world. Um, like, a, like a neuro version of a golden section. And the problem I was having with the EEG was it amplifies an electrical signal, right? You strap this thing on, and what I realized, I'm trying to measure brain, right? And what I'm getting instead is, like, whether you're scrunching up your forehead or moving your eyebrow, I just didn't think I was measuring anything real. And I thought, Hmm. I thought back, like how, I'm trying to measure this directly, and I thought, how else can I, right, get at this idea of brain patterns? And I thought back to my early days of compact computer. We'd get, right, reverse engineer. We used to get the competitor's product, we'd, right, bring it in the conference room, completely disassemble it, and look at all the pieces and try to figure out how it worked. And I thought, well, maybe I can do that around the brain and, and take a look at, you know, kind of some subconscious measurement of time, right? All that little multitasking stuff, right, that we're doing, all the little parsing bits of time. And I thought, well, I'll measure my time. And right at the point where I figured out how hard it is to really write down your minute-by-minute -minute time, I found Ben Lipkowitz. And Ben had been measuring his time 24 hours a day, minute-by-minute, minute, going back to 2005. He's, he's, yeah, I've met him, he's fabulous. Um, and it was really exciting because uh, the way I'd imagined time and the way he was measuring time felt really similar. So I started making drawings and it was later that very same summer, a friend of mine who's on the faculty at NYU, uh, he happens uh, to run the New York chapter of the quantified self. He looks at me and he goes, Lori, this is really good, but you should measure something about yourself. And I was like, all right, okay. So I, um, I discovered a Zio, which is yet another headband. And um, it's a really accurate way to measure sleep, right? And you don't have to do anything. You don't write anything down, right? You just strap this thing on, you go to sleep, it grabs all the data for you. And um, I... It was, really, it was really quite interesting because this idea of all these little snippets of time, waking, Ben's all of his waking time, and my sleeping time, it was, right, it was all these little patterns and snippets. And I became super, super interested in sleep. All the good stuff happens when you sleep. And I started to really think about my patterns of sleep. And if anybody uses a Zio, I ditch their graphics and um, put it all in Excel. And you're looking at night after night, all the purple stuff is the fabulous, fab, right, that's deep sleep, that's the good stuff. And you can see partway through the month, you can start to see there's a pattern. These big orange sections are when I'm waking up at night, right, I'm cool, but 
something's really stressing me out, right? I am waking up for hours at a time. And, you know, I really started to think about, right, these patterns of data about me. And here's one that's even easier to read. So she's, right, you start to see her, right, the patterns of her time, and then all of a sudden, toward the end of the month, boom, right, something bad is going on, right? She's like huge amounts of time where she's awake. And I started to look at these patterns of data and realized I could see even more subtleties in the data, right? I took my sleep patterns and I compared them to others. And I realized, you know, there's something very specific in this, right? There's something very individual to me, almost like this fingerprint. And I thought, hmm, this feels very, I mean, this feels very much like I'm specific. This is very specific to me. And um, it was right about this time, um, I, didn't want to be, I didn't want to be the only one that was jumping into bed every night with this thing strapped around my forehead. So my husband got a Zio, and he started to measure his sleep. And he always thought, oh God, I sleep, I sleep terrible. Well, it turns out, part of the time he sleeps bad, badly, and part of the time he sleeps amazingly well. Right, so he swings wildly. But my sleep's pretty steady. And I thought, oh, there's something very insightful here. I mean, it was like, oh, there's like some essential, I mean, I thought, oh, there's some essential, right, idea of who we are in this. And so you might think, well, why, right, what would my patterns look like, right? Am I really moody, right? Am I steady? Are they gonna, right, all of a sudden you think, what would, what would I look like? So I grabbed all this raw data, and as an artist, I started to, um, translated into um, the feel of human time, right? Here's an argument, right? Here's um, something really stressful, and here's, right, I'm eating an ice cream sundae, right? The, right? the sense of, and I put it all into a show in Los Angeles, and the show got noticed. I mean, it, it, got, it got reviewed, and not just in the art sections of the newspaper, it got in tech pubs. It got in New Scientist and in Gadget. I mean, these were things, and, and, and as an artist, it's, it's thrill, I mean, it's thrilling. But then you have this moment of just panic. Right at the end of a show, it's like, oh, what do I do next? I mean, what do I do next? And I realized I'd never stopped measuring my sleep, and I thought, well, maybe I should measure more. Right, the sleep was so easy. What else is like that? I could, you know, I could try to live in the future a little bit. And, um, you know, I realized, right, sensors are going to be like embedded in our clothes and, right, stuck on our skin. There's one that just got FDA approval that's this little tiny thing that you swallow, right? I mean, even now, right, your phone has five sensors in it. You spend a lot of time, right, every, right there's a few people sneaking over here, watching your phone, but pretty soon your phone's going to watch you. And you think, yeah. Ugh, no, no, no. What if I, I mean, no, no. What if somebody really kept track of, like, everywhere I went and what I, you know, the nutrition of what I really ate? No, 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 no. To be human, I've had people say this, to be human is to be a mystery. Uh, one of the neuroscientists in the lab, a week ago, I explained what I'm working on and she goes, Lori, is it possible to have too much data about yourself? You know, so if that's going through your mind, it's not just you. But for me, I decided, you know, to run straight toward the data. I, um, I got a Fitbit, I measured my steps, I, right, I get on a Wi-Fi scale every day, um, I spit in a tube, I got my DNA snippets, I turned on manic time on my laptop, keeps track of everything I do, I open paths on my phone everywhere I've gone, I set up an email trigger and I score how my stomach feels and then exactly what I've eaten, and um, there's some more. <laughs> but I don't want to sound, I don't want to sound, I mean, I'm, I'm I don't want to sound nutty, but I, no, really, I'm really, I'm no, I mean, if people know me, I'm like the most balanced person. But I wanted to get the date over long periods of time, and, um, and now I have, um, you know, years, I have years of data and thousands of data points. But I'm not, I mean, I'm not naive about data privacy. 
you know, you probably looked at yourself, right? You've taken a look, what's public about me online? What's knowable? I mean, I actually even made a list once. What are all those different sources? If the CIA came after me, what could they find? Um, but right now, you can get really upset about tracking cookies. Do you own your email? What's on Facebook? All your Google search history? Every app you turn on knows where you're located, right? You can, my, my sense right now is, you know, they measure me, now I measure me. You have data, I have data. Fight back. <laughs> Come to the party. Um, it, it, it's made me a lot more aware, but basically, I think, I mean, seriously, I think in the end, we are going to own our own data. Okay, so I'm measuring away, I'm adding more columns to the spreadsheet, and I think I'm gonna find causal relationships. I mean, I think I'm gonna start to figure this out. And the truth is, a lot of self-tracking data, it's boring. And it's really noisy data. And you end up with a lot of numbers. And numbers are really abstract concepts to us, right? Particularly big numbers. But we recognize pattern intuitively. We're wired for pattern recognition. And what I started to see in the data was this sense of something very specific Right? Something human, something specific, something recognizable. Almost like this fingerprint. It's almost as though we're creating, right? It's almost like a human data portrait. We're creating all this data. If only we'd stop and notice it. And I thought, maybe art, the language of art, art can get you to look. All these little cut blocks are symptom data of a population of ALS patients. And ALS, it's, I mean, Lou Gehrig's, it's a horrible disease. People can barely talk about it. But in this case, the metaphor, the, the language, the sense of it being art can, can pull you in, can get you to spend time, can make it approachable. And I thought, well, maybe pattern can be the way we consume data, almost like a language, right? With an algorithm, with a model, with a set of rules, that it's a language and pattern that we can learn to read Right, you can start to see this part's really stressful, right? Or all of a sudden, right, I can start to read my pattern, something's gone bad. Or, right, start to just notice yourself. But the idea of pattern as a, as, as a, with, a, with the feel and sensibility from an artist starts to be something that you're willing to look at. Um, right now, I'm working with um, instant message chat data from a group of software developers. Not in a, I mean, not in a literal way, not like infographics but where the pattern starts to be the experience around the data and then the data itself to play it back to them as pattern. You know, it's not a crazy idea, this languages, they're long-standing languages. Um, the knotted number systems of the Incas, right? They're these navigational stick charts that are based completely on the feel of waves and Mayan glyphs, which are all about Right, how one glyph, the aesthetics of one glyph next to another. And so these patterns, they're not random. They're meaningful. They're us. They're a way to see ourselves. It's recognizable, it's familiar. I think our data patterns are the way to see ourselves, who we are. Who am I? What's possible for me? For me, after right, all of this data measuring, what I found was the, the measuring gave me a sense of being, of being acknowledged, even when it was coming from a mechanical device. You know, it's funny, self-tracking always gets described in this very Calvinist, right? It's about health, it's about fitness. And I, I really think it's something more compelling. I, th I think it's about who, understanding who we are. It's about identity. At this intersection of art and science, I have found intense beauty in the patterns of how we live in us. And I think there's something here. I don't, I mean, I, I'll be truthful with you. I don't completely have it wrapped up, but I'm thinking that science, maybe my friends, the neuroscientists, in my lifetime will start to understand why do these data patterns resonate? Why does this, why does it feel like a connection? Maybe it turns out that it boosts our immune system or balances our mood. 
or simply gives us a bond with ourselves. Okay, I'm right at the end here, and I want to know if it's still going through your mind. I don't know, Lori, all that data. No, it's just going to magnify my defects. It's going to kill the mystery. But I'm hoping I can flip your opinion about self-tracking data being something that's kind of creepy to something that you love. And you won't fear the phone watching you because it's going to be the understanding of who we are. And we won't fear it. And in the end, I predict that all these data patterns, right, that we're just going to run straight toward our data. Thank you. <laughs>